This was permission from Adrian to start. He whispered into my ears, start. So good evening to the final session of the eighth, sixth, no, eighth Tirana Connectivity Forum with six special envoys. And uh, my name is Dusan Relic, and I was invited by the Hachkai Corporation to moderate tonight. When I read the whole list of special envoys speaking tonight. I must admit that I had an association with a Yugoslav movie from the 70s. The movie was called Special Education. And the director was Goran Markovic, and one of the head roles was by Fekin Bechmiu. Fekin Bechmiu, one of the greatest, greatest Yugoslav uh, actors. It was about a, it was a social drama taking place in a Borstal, which is a prison for unruly youths, and therefore it's called special education. So perhaps my association was a little bit out of, out of the box, you know, Do, does the Balkans need special envoys to educate it so that it can move into the European Union? But I guess that uh, I'd be accepting the Balkanization narrative that we usually criticize very much for this. In any case, our guests tonight are Sofia Gramata, Greek Special Envoy for the Western Balkans. Welcome. Uh, Julian Middelhoff, the Dutch Regional Envoy for Stability in the Western Balkans, and as I have learned, stationed in Skopje. And uh, Manuel Sarasin, the German Special Envoy for Western Balkans, who warned me that we had to finish in time because he wants to see the football match afterwards. Yes, yeah, so, so you know what makes us special. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we have a fourth participant online, which will be Hannes Eigner, the Austrian Special Envoy, but somehow the internet, the mysteries of the internet, we are not yet online with him, but as soon as he is on the screen, he'll join us. Uh, we owe you perhaps an explanation of the title a little bit, from enlargement to cohesion policy. And these two idioms don't come immediately to your mind when you think about what's happening. But it's a product of the many discussions that uh, Adrian and I and other people who are involved in this had in the last couple of years. Basically, I think that in the meanwhile, political science has produced a consensus that just talking about enlargement and doing enlargement policy without ensuring cohesion of the region with the rest of, the, of Europe and the European Union doesn't work. And this is something that we would like to discuss a little bit with, in more detail with you. You know, the, re the region is heavily integrated into the European Union. 70% of the trade of the region is with the European Union. And FDIs in the region are to 90 degrees coming from the European Union. You, we have the banking sector, which is also firmly in the hands of banks from the European Union. And what is perhaps most important in terms of human interaction, we have about a quarter of the population born in this region in the last 25 years living in the European Union and they send remittances. So in terms of social economic integration into the European Union, the region is more integrated than Germany because Germany has only 45% of its trade with the European Union. That's, these are the facts. But of course, uh, it, Germany plays a little bit of a different role in European integration. The European Un Union is usually understood as a huge convergence machine. Convergence in the sense of producing the same set of values, producing the same set of regulation, and what is most important, producing the same socioeconomic circumstances in which people should be living. This is why we have cohesion funds, why we have uh, various other instruments, like now the recovery fund, which are all meant not to permit 
all parts of the European way to drift apart too much. The region itself, although it is open to the European Union, stabilization association agreements is at this moment diverging in socio-economic terms from the European Union and not converging. <laughs> I'll give you just one by example, empirical example why. In the next seven years, from the monies coming from the social and cohesion fund and the recovery fund, a country like Greece or a country like Croatia, each citizen will receive 11 times more money from those funds than an average citizen of the region will receive from the IPA monies. So whatever we do, there will be in the next seven years, not more convergence of the region with the EU, but there will be more divergence. And the direct product of this is that people do not see their future in the region. They move where society is more beneficial to them. So this long introduction was simply to set the stage for a debate whether really we should start talking in more direct terms about the necessity to enlarge the enlargement policy to include cohesion policy in it in more material, in substantial financial terms. I'd like to ask each of the special representatives one question to get the discussion rolling. And uh, the, thing, the questions I have to warn you will be a bit tongue in cheek a little bit to get a little bit of dynamism in the whole this game. Madame Gramata, you come from Greece. And as you said just before, this is the most beautiful country. And uh, we all share this with you. We would all love to live in Greece and to enjoy the, the Greek way of life and the summer and so on. But in terms of Greece's exemplary role to the region, because it's part of the region, aren't we in a situation that the region, if it really wants to move fast, should avoid the mistakes that Greece has made in the past couple of years, like the financial and debt crisis, like the treatment of the media at the moment, like this story about eavesdropping on the opposition. My question is, what's the positive role of Greece for the region at this moment? Greece's role for the region was always positive. And uh, everybody remembers uh, the agenda of Thessaloniki of 2003, where the, this enlargement process in favor of the Western Balkans started. Uh, Greece has uh, undergone a great reform process, also due to the economic crisis. And in fact, as you mentioned, countries of the region can be inspired by our example because we overcame these difficulties. In fact, uh, not only a dire economic situation, but restrictions that uh, were acknowledged by main EU partners as really painful restrictions for the Greek people. We made reforms, painful reforms, and we are now on the way for, uh, to, towards growth. And we see the growth. We see different uh, results in everyday life of uh, Greek citizens. The brain drain, that is one of the main problems of Western Balkans, was for years also the problem of Greece during the economic crisis. And we already see Greek citizens coming back to Greece now due to the fact that the economic situation becomes more and more uh, good, as I said, for the Greek citizens. Today I had uh, discussions with our Albanian friends and I stressed the fact uh, that my country is not only an EU country, but an EU country that has uh, recent experiences 
of the need for reforms. And we can exchange know-how, not only with Albania, but with all partners of the region as regards this experience. So your message per astera ad astra, through suffering, through reforms to the European stars. So what, what would you say was essential for Greece to make this turn towards reforms? Was it pressure from outside or did you see from inside a kind of a pressure from the population to change how things are operated? Pressure, pressure from both outside and inside uh, was needed for these reforms to take place. The reforms were to the benefit of Greek people in spite of uh, a very difficult situation, as I mentioned, that Greek people had to face for years. There are some, there is some criticism in Greece, but also from within other EU countries, that Greece uh, faced uh, a lot of uh, austerity from other EU member states, that we had um, a harsh treatment in a way or the other. The result anyhow is good. I wouldn't go back to the past because it's never good to go that much back to the past. Uh, no matter whether the pressure was uh, from outside or not, it was from the family because the EU is a family after all. And that's why everybody wants to join it because in spite of differences, differences uh, in economic situations because of uh, between countries that are on my right and left side and my own country, we share some common values. We value these principles. And I think that um, they make our common treasure. Madam Gramata, thank you for your wise words. And I think that in the discussion, you'll be facing more questions. And it's interesting to hear that it was useful to experience also pressure from outside to have things changed. This is something which is, I think, of high, highly relevant to the region. Uh, Yurian Middelhoff, uh, Dutch Regional Limbo for Stability in the Western Balkans. Uh, <coughs> Madam Gramata gave me a direct connection with you. She mentioned the frugality in a way that governed Dutch policies, but also German policies towards Greece during the financial crisis. People in the region have some questions towards the Netherlands. First one is, why are you interested in the region? Why are you so strict to the region? Your, your trade is far bigger with your former colonies, 10 or 15 times bigger. There are not so many people from the region in the Netherlands. Why do you bother so much and why do you insist so much on all of those frugality things? I think that your parliament even has to vote on, on, on uh, whether, whether someone will be accepted to the European Union one day or not. So it's a dead end, right, at the moment? Uh, thank you very much for your, your questions. Um, so the Netherlands has indeed a very keen interest um, to this region. Uh, and I think it stems from the fact that we view this region not as the outskirts of Europe, but very much the inner court of, of Europe. And uh, uh, there's a common misconception that the Dutch policy towards the Western Balkans is that we're strict but fair. In fact, the Netherlands is strict, fair and engaged with the Western Balkans, and in particular, the, um, uh, the current, the new government in the, in the Netherlands uh, wants to give a little bit more, uh, um, uh, well, show more what this engaged also means. So 
uh, we're investing. Uh, that's why we don't have one special envoy for the Western Balkans. We have three, uh, of which I'm only one. So um, uh, if, if I consider the amount of work that I uh, have on, the, on my plate, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's not, but uh, uh, if I consider the amount of work that I have on my plate already, uh, I can only have huge respect for my colleagues uh, who must have three times as much work that, uh, that we're doing. We have uh, on each of our priority uh, areas for, for the Western Balkans, which is rule of law, stability and security. We have dedicated uh, envoys who are not only, uh, who are actually also based in the region to get a first-hand perspective of what's actually happening uh, here in, in the Western Balkans. And that is all to show how we are uh, committed to the region. And we've been working like this for, for several years uh, now already. So you're confident that once the parliament has to vote whether to accept anyone from the Western Balkans with the help of the special envoys and their information to, to the Dutch public and the policy, polity, there will be a positive vote. I'm very positive that if the countries in the Western Balkans that aspire to become a member of the European Union and implement all of the reforms that are necessary to get there, that they will get a positive vote, yes. Pay attention to all the reforms which are necessary. I think this is the very important cue. Uh, okay, I, uh, we have information that uh, Johannes Eigner will join us quite soon, the Austrian Special Envoy. So. Don't worry, the Austrian voice will be also heard. I'd like to move now to uh, Manuel Saracin, who is, for the first time, the, West, the German government has a special envoy on for the Western Balkans, right? You, you had in the foreign ministries, you had uh, people in charge, but you are politically the first envoy. Actually, the position is translated as special representative. Okay. As somebody told me the difference is actually... <laughs> Yeah, yes. um, and it's the first time that the German government of the Federal Republic of Germany has a special representative for anything at all. And it's a, like it's a cabinet decision so, of the federal government. It's not only a position in the foreign ministry. So um, kind of in the Netherlands it would have been, you know, if, if we had more than one special uh, representative, then in German federalism, it would be already a bunch of, so better if only one, yeah? <laughs> okay, so uh, it's, it's a sign for sure of the increased attention of the new government in Berlin towards the region. And it's also a sign that uh, things are not going away in the region if you sense the necessity to have a special representative with all the other diplomats who are already working on this region. But this feeling that the German government has been always paying more attention to the region than the others. And this was obviously the case already since 91. Germany was spearheading the Western efforts on what's happening here. This led to a perception that Germany in the Western Balkans is sometimes perceived as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. On the one hand, bilateral economic assistance, interest, presence here in very many ways. On the other hand, strict approach, insistence of very, on many things that other considered sometimes problematical. One example back in history, Montenegro got candidate status 2012, but Berlin insisted that the negotiations should start one year later. So this was a new form of waiting for the candidate countries to be sufficiently prepared. Now we had heard from Chancellor Schultz in the Prague speech that he would like to see enlargement speeded up, more done about it. But on the other hand, he said, almost in the same sentence, we have to change the decision-making in the European Union. We have, especially in terms of foreign and security policy, and we have to make majority decisions possible. The Czech presidency did a review. 20 out of 27 countries are against it. So does it mean that, again, Germany provided a new opening? Let's hurry up with the enlargement, but also prevented the enlargement because no one is going to accept this majority vote. No, um, it's clear position of the chancellor that the enlarged European Union has to change. And I can only underline, if you look to the history of enlargement, 
I would even as a historian, not as a German government representative, make the thesis that any deepening of the European Union had the necessity of an enlargement before. The successful pressure to uh, efficient deepening of the European Union was usually caused by an enlargement before. And I'm quite sure if you look back to the last 50 years of uh, an EU enlargement, um, you will follow this argument quite strictly since 74, by the way. By the way, Mr. Rilic, there your statistics is wrong. The German trade with the European Union internal market is 50% of the share, but it lost 10% because of UK leaving. Uh, so if you, <laughs> it depends on if we see UK as a part of integrating Europe or not, <laughs> how to take it. It's perhaps an interesting question. Um, yeah, but I would say it's quite clear. Um, Chancellor Scholz has a personal uh, conviction regarding the Western Balkans, as well as Foreign Minister Baerbock. He wants the region to proceed and he wants that the people here can believe in a realistic aim that they will see enlargement taking place so that they can feel it still. And this is the ideology behind uh, not only the coalition, but also behind the persons. And uh, I can only say if I listen who is talking also in the background to journals about these topics, uh, it comes from heart. And uh, this is the important message. This doesn't mean that, of, co of course, you still have to do all necessary reforms. Um, but if you do it, uh, you will be positively rewarded uh, by us. Uh, well, yes, uh, if, if Germany wanted to reach the same level of trade integration with the Europe with with the European Union, it would have to grow from 50 to 75 percent because the countries of the region have 75 percent of trade integration. But this is completely on the side. Uh, let me move a little bit to the cohesion aspect. It's of course everyone is happy that the most that the some of the most important countries in the European Union are supporting enlargement in Southeast Europe. But what about this aspect that the region is diverging in social economic terms? And with the amount of solidarity that the European Union is delivering to the region, uh, this divergence will continue. It cannot be stopped. And this solidarity is not based on, the Germans would say, milde garden, that we should provide you with some little money. The region, because of trade, because of foreign direct investments, because of banking system is actually transferring more money to the European Union than it's receiving in any form. Just the trade deficit in 10 years was more than 100, 100 billion euro with the EU of the Southeast European six. If you take into account only one thing, and this is the loss in human capital of people moving out of migration, then the transfers from, from the region are actually killing the region. So is there a discussion in your countries about treating the region in terms of solidarity, cohesion funds, recovery funds, as if they were already members of the EU? There's a discussion on this taking place. And I think you're referring to the concepts which are brought up by think tanks and intellectual uh, circles in Brussels and in other capitals. And um, I can say that first, this argument is showing that the cohesion policy of the European Union is quite successful, despite all negative connotation quite often brought up. The cohesion policy of the European Union is the backbone of positive development in the internal market. Although, especially in the Eurozone, we are seeing similar developments which were highlighted a lot when we were seeing the debt crisis, the so-called debt crisis with Greece a lot. Um, I personally can have an easy position. I'm handling the Western Balkans. So of course, I'm always in favor of more money for them. But of course, I cannot talk for my finance ministry and for the German parliament uh, regarding the next MFF settings. Um, I think we need to advocate for more, but it must be a reasonable more. Uh, I have the one fear that if the night of the long knives is, start, is taking place in Brussels and Mr. Relic is not sitting at the table, I have a bit of fear that if nobody is having a veto for the region to uh, block the deal on the whole MFF in the end, 
uh, everybody might in the end forget the region for his own pocket. And so I think that this um, theoretical idea must be somehow underpinned with a fixed amount. And I don't know if it's really perfect to put it in total the schemes of European level or in other schemes. Second point is this, of course, we still have to have a difference between staying outside and getting inside. I mean, I don't want to have, for example, let's take a theoretical country of the Western Balkan 6, I don't know which, uh, just forgetting about chapter 23, but already getting all the money from the new uh, anti-corona second N NGO fund, for example. So there must be also the one next leap to fully integrate, to still have the incentive to fully, fully integrate. So as far as I understood, um, the theoretical thinkings are meaning something like a high one digit or a low two digit billion uh, euros amount a year. Um, I think this should be affordable for European Union in general. But if you look at the budget constraints coming up, this recession taking place, and you know the 1% rule or the 1.75, uh, the 1.27% rule, the budget and total numbers will probably decrease also in the next years. This will be a tough fight. And I don't want to like make promises or big hopes which are not so easy to reach. You remember that quite often Germany was paying in the end like 100 million to Poland for getting an MMF deal done in the end. So really small numbers in the end were fought because everybody sitting at the table with the accounting machine in his hands only to show at home, I got more money than the others. And I have a fear that we need to find a way of negotiating that, that, you know, the Western Balkans are not forgotten in this logic, because if you look at the negotiation kind of MFF business today, I fear that we can promise a lot and before, but the night of the long knives, it will not survive. If, before I grill the other two special members, whether they see a inclination in their country to show more solidarity to the Western Balkans in financial terms based on the amount of money coming from the Western Balkans to the EU. Let me just uh, give you two data. The University of Ljubljana did a calculation of how much would it be necessary in money terms to treat the Western Balkans the way EU member countries are treated in uh, the cohesion and social fund. Depending on the country, it's between 0.01 euro per year per inhabitant and 10 euros per inhabitant per year. So it's, it's a sum which the taxpayers in the European Union would not even sense for a second. Mr. Rilic, I was handling European affairs in the German parliament in opposition for a long, long time. And I was always stressing for higher European budget. Um, and it's quite an interesting that if you look how the German net position in the budget developed before Corona over the last 10 years, it almost doubled. The main point to reach this was nobody was talking about, by the way. Uh, so we increased our position from like seven to eight billion a year to 14, 15, depends on economic situation. And actually nobody really recognized. And I think that was, by the way, a tactics of Mr. Schäuble. He was always publicly strict against too much money for Europe, but the budget line sort of made it different. Um, so I think it's not only about like, you know, if it's affordable, but also about the political communication. But to be clear on that, I fear that the questions of European financing will get tougher because bad times are coming up. And this just everybody has to know. It's not that easy to say, yeah, they're going to join cohesion funds and then suddenly the money is falling off the heaven. Also in this structures, you need to politically fight for against um, others who want it at home as well, who will not confess it uh, in beforehand, perhaps. Yeah, we are talking about, as you said, one to three billion euro per year altogether. Uh, and Gramata, would the Greeks be ready to show more solidarity with their vicinity? I think that some terms used here are not exact terms. It seems uh, that uh, you distinguish uh, EU countries between net contributors and net recipients. There is no such an issue within the EU. Greece is not a net recipient because Greece also 
uh, offers its scientists to other EU countries because they are our partners, they are our family. There is an EU mobility. So you have mentioned the fact that Western Balkans uh, face this uh, brain drain in favor of uh, EU countries. We face the same issue. Um, a medical doctor in Greece to be educated costs some uh, 120,000 euro from the first year of the primary school until the last year of the university. And they go to these beautiful countries. Why? Not because they are obliged to, because they are free to. This is the word within the EU, free mobility. So uh, in a way, um, the net recipients of the EU also make a lot of sacrifices, both in political, but also in economic terms. The Greece um, was uh, on the door of the EU for many years, and uh, our way to the EU stopped for political reasons, because there was a lack of rule of law due to the dictatorship. So also back uh, 40 years now, these principles that uh, are the main principles of the EU today, they were also principles of the EU back in 1980, where finally the decision was made for Greece to join the European Union. And um, of course we are in favor, Greece is in favor of more funds for Western Balkan countries, not only because we are altruistic, but because Greece is part of this region, because we have always been here, because we are one of the main investors in all Western Balkan six. We are, we are one of the main commercial partners of the region. And the more stability in the region reigns, the more stability for our investment and uh, for our environment exists. Of course, we are in favor and uh, we could somehow combine what was said by Mr. Zaratsin and um, what you suggest. In fact, we could see perhaps, we could examine in Brussels as an EU family, all of us, a way forward in order for more, uh, let's say, uh, results, more reform results uh, to be um, rewarded by more funds. And um, the new IPA 3 regulations, in a way, try to combine some kind uh, of rewards with uh, outcomes. The most uh, elaborated the projects are, no matter from which country they are presented, these projects, the more money they will receive. And um, so this is, uh, let's say, remark. Of course, we are in favor. Uh, well, I, would, I think the audience would love to hear from you also this sentence. Yeah. But can you, can you say well, so? I started off by saying that the Dutch government is indeed showing much more engagement to the region. So in that sense, there is already a positive notion. But when you put the question as bluntly in front of the panel, uh, as you did, uh, should we channel uh, cohesion for, or open up more cohesion funds for uh, the Western Balkan region? You've uh, accidentally hit up upon one of my, uh, my, uh, my areas of, of interest, namely the financial, multi-annual financial framework of which I was part for, of the negotiating team for, on behalf of the Netherlands for the previous MFF. And uh, what we should realize is that for, in order for uh, member states to qualify for cohesion funds, these member states went through a process of reforms, of democratization, of adhering to the fundamental rights of the, of the European Union. And all of that is in a way to prepare them for the absorption of such funds. And hence the importance of the accession process and the merit-based approach to the accession process. Uh, 
based upon exactly those, those principles, uh, democracy, rule of law, fundamental rights, and uh, all focusing on a future role within the European Union. And, and I fully agree, and I'm very happy uh, that we do have the IPA 3 and, and the, still the IPA 2 uh, funds available for, for this region. And um, I think, and this conference is a, is a perfect example of that, that there's also, even within those envelopes, a lot of improvement possible to make this, uh, this region better connected to amongst itself, but also towards the, the European Union. I think I've been mischievous enough with the members of the panel so that I would invite the audience to continue with the hard work. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we could, like in the German press club on television, you know, they used to get the wine during the de debates before in the good old times. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the, the problem is with uh, that I don't, I can't, because of the light, I don't see anyone who wants to raise his hand. So maybe I'm opening the debate. Please ask questions which have to do with enlargement and cohesion or whatever you want. But make yourself visible and he heard because the lights are quite strong. Is there anyone who will break the one, the, uh, the ice? Yes, Left. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Let, uh, let us have your name and institution. Of course. Please. I'm Kostian. Uh, today I'm part of uh, Henrik Bo Stiftung Group in this activity. So my question is related to the energy crisis. If you see the news today, the biggest news is the explosion that just happened in the, uh, in the pipeline in the, in the Baltic Sea, which is a terrible thing to happen right now. So as we know, the winter will be difficult and will be difficult also for Western Balkans. And as we all know, the, the economic situation right now in our country is not the best. Do you think that very, there should be, uh, let's say, uh, a packet of help for Western Balkans to that will be affected by this crisis because also our prime minister has said that during COVID, uh, EU in the first stages was not close to Western Balkans. For example, Albania took the first vaccines from Turkey. Do you agree with that statement? And how uh, Western Balkan will be supported uh, from this crisis, let's say, thank you. Okay, the question is in a broader sense, is the European Union taking into account the deep level of integration of the countries with the EU when it's planning emergency measures, if I may rephrase it a little bit. So uh, I'd like to collect three questions and then go for the debate. Ardian? Yes, but did I see another hand as well? No, it just looked like Ardian. Yes, sorry, I, I thought I saw a hand, so yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Marta Szpala, Center for Eastern Studies, uh, Poland. Uh, I have a question to you because we are speaking of the enlargement, but we don't see any dg representative here. And I would like to ask you uh, about how do you see the role of, like, or it is still enlargement policy, EU policy, because we see here only national representative. In the DG year, we have a lot of active directors. So this is the thing which was always put um, like against the, the countries in the Western Balkans. And now we are have the same in the DG year. So we don't have the director for three years or something. So what is happening with DG year and our institution who are supposed to conduct the policy towards the region? And the second question is, do you think that what is happening in the East, like war on Ukraine, will somehow have an impact on the policy and how your states perceived, um, yeah, the, how, how, how it is changing the role, the geopolitical role of EU Commission in this region, but also in the East. Thank you. Magda is writing a paper on the nationalization of enlargement policies. So this is the background of the question. Uh, Arjen. Uh, and I will complement, complement the possible what uh, Marta just said with uh, the role of uh, the Berlin process into how to complement or how to improve or how to boost the enlargement. 
how what do we expect from a building process 2.0 Okay, three questions. Should we start perhaps again in the order with Madame Gramata starting and then having the Dutch and then the German special representative? Okay, so Chris is, uh, Chris is, Chris is uh, stressing the fact that uh, no matter what uh, happens uh, in the Eastern Europe, and uh, taking into consideration what happens in Ukraine, which is a very painful war for peace in Europe, the Western Balkans should not be left behind, by no means should be left behind. So that's why Greece would favor also some ideas towards granting the candidate status to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We want to examine together with uh, our EU family partners, some every, let's say, possibility for the enlargement process to be accelerated as much as possible. The Contribution of the Commission is always precious. And uh, in fact, uh, following the recommendations of the Commission, the member states decide on the enlargement. But uh, the final decisions are always made by the states. The question regarding the Berlin process can be answered by my country, which participates but does not have a leading role as Germany here, that uh, we deem the, that the Berlin process has a high value as a, an instrument of the region and for the region that can accelerate the integration of the Western Balkan six between themselves create a kind, let's say, of free area of, of uh, mergence of their economies, of their societies, enhance people to people contacts with agreements that have already been signed or are expected to be concluded in the near future. And this will serve as a first tool for the integration of the whole region within the EU in the nearest possible future. Yeah, uh, let me start by answering uh, your question with regards to the COVID relief, because that's very, very dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it is a great misconception that the EU didn't uh, deliver any COVID relief to this region. It was by far the biggest uh, uh, donor when it comes to uh, both uh, disposables as well as vaccines later on. And, and I, I very much reg regret the... the the relative poor uh, communication that went around it, but the, the um, other donors are not even near uh, uh, to what the EU has delivered to the entire region of the Western Balkans in that regard. Uh, so also in that regard, I think this region is very much part of, of the European family and uh, it won't be forgotten. Um, then to answer the other question with regards to the effects of uh, what's happening in Ukraine uh, on uh, the enlargement process. Well, I very much agreed with what uh, Professor Tsoukalis was saying uh, in the session this morning, that uh, enlargement is more urgent than ever, but it might also be more difficult than ever. Uh, and that means that the burden is very much on those countries, those aspiring countries, to demonstrate that they are up for that, that challenge. Um, 
so, and what was the other well, the, the question on the Berlin process? I, I happily leave to my colleague, Mrs. Hansen, but uh, we're here to, from my part, we're just happy that there's renewed engagement in the process and that it's also widened a bit to topics, very important topics, also for my portfolio when it comes to migration or security. Uh, so we very much applaud that. I believe that the war in Ukraine is having significant changes for the region, but I also have the feeling that not many decision makers in the region yet have uh, adopted their political tactics or strategies towards it. And this would be an own panel to exaggerate on all that. Um, one point is, first, every step forward done by Ukraine is positive for the Western Balkans. Ukraine brought back that the only functioning geopolitical instrument Europe has and ever had was enlargement, not something like second class, Eastern partnership, neighborhood policy. No, enlargement is the geopolitical instrument. And that Ukraine had to be granted the candidate's status because this is the instrument, is a clear saying on that there is no other option for this region than full-fledged membership. Then we can be creative on how to reach it better and how to make it better incentives on the way, but I think this is important to say. Second, we were all hoping that there will be some tigers in the region bringing the other ones to be more fast in this regatta principle. Perhaps the last years it was a bit the regatta to the bottom. As less you deliver, as better progress you get in the process and other way around. With Ukraine and also to a certain extent with Moldova, I'm sure this will change. The Ukrainians will reform like hell. And this will put a lot of pressure on elites in this region, positive pressure. By the way, Ukraine also has some EU staff working there and helping delivering the papers which you need in the paperwork to the European Commission. But I think it's really important for this region to understand, talking negative about Ukraine coming so fast will not work for long. Also people in this region will ask why a country in war can make this paperwork do reforms and we not. And this is to a certain extent also what I hope can be positive. So I really hope that the third point which Madame Gramata made so clearly also will work out. If we are going forward with Ukraine because they deliver and there's political pressure and the war, this will of course give a big leap also in having political engagement in this region. It will not deliver, I think, in the sense of Ukraine is getting forward, so even if you did nothing, you will go forward. But it will for sure create the understanding that we cannot leave the Western Balkans behind as well. And I think that in this sense also, we already saw with the results we had in the last weeks and months, which were not already the big, everything is solved results, but small steps, that this were also linked to the situation there. And then the force, which is also really important to see. Everybody who thinks about freedom, democracy, and rule of law in this region has to know that my children can play in my garden in peace and security because Ukrainians are dying for my freedom at the front line, because Putin will not stop. I'm quite sure that the safety and stability of this region is secured by the not success of the Russians in Kiev and in the East as well. So Ukraine is also fighting for a positive situation here. And uh, yeah, perhaps this is also my comment on these videos posted from some meetings and the surroundings of the Ungar. Sorry, what video, Mrs. Heretti? The videos, yeah. no, I don't want to be more concrete on this. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Uh, hello, I'm Gledis Jepali uh, from European Movement Albania. Uh, my, questions, uh, my question is related uh, regarding uh, to the alignment or not uh, of the Western Balkan countries to the, for, to the common foreign and security policy of, of EU. Uh, my question is, uh, is, it, is it really worth it? I mean, does it play a role in uh, speeding up or slowing down the process of accession? Yeah. Uh, because we know uh, the, the pressure uh, from the so-called third actors, so not just 
Russia, which is uh, much clear in this situation, but also China or Turkey or other countries in the Middle East. Have... Ameri America. Uh, America, yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, does it uh, really play a role? I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple question. Thank Sorry? Uh, Mr. Sartin added one uh, country which might play a role as well in this sense. This is the UK, really. I think we should look at it very carefully. But Peter Gerk from, the, from Slovenia, who is the Secretary General of the Blood Forum, uh, wants to come in with a question. Please, Peter. Thank you, Dushan, so that I don't have to introduce myself. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, and I think this is still valid, um, it's a matter of political will. It's true, circumstances changed. It's true, we are in a different situation that we have been when the last enlargement took place uh, in Europe. This is all true, and there is 27 countries, and. Uh, uh, the decision-making process is uh, far more difficult than it was, and you have a possibility of a veto, which we saw some countries use quite uh, proficiently and profoundly. But at the end of the day, it's a matter of political will, you know. And also, it's a matter of uh, chicken and egg. Like uh, when uh, you were discussing uh, the money or the, the financing and the rule of law, I think you can't show me probably in the world one country which is poor who has a functioning rule of law system it's impossible it's impossible to build a rule of law system in countries where judges have uh, 400 or 500 or 600 uh, euros per month so you know this chicken and egg uh, debate uh, what do you do first do you give them uh, financing so that they can alleviate to some point where you can actually build the rule of law or you wait for them to build something which is unbuildable basically and you are stalling the whole process i'm not saying i'm right probably i am but <laughs> but what i'm saying is that uh, you know this debate is going on for 25 years now and we still can't decide what is right what is not thanks Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Oskar Roginer uh, from Europeum from Prague. Uh, Mr. Middlehoff mentioned that the EU has helped the Western Balkans with the, during the COVID and after COVID. Uh, nevertheless, the citizens of the Western Balkans or the large chunk of them are still under the impression that a great deal of help came from China or Russia, Turkey also. Uh, also that they are also convinced that despite of the EU and the US being one of the largest investors in the region, uh, they are under the impression that the large, large investors are coming from Russia and of course China. Uh, and this is because the media landscape is dominated by the daily and, uh, daily and uh, weekly newspapers, uh, portals, uh, and radio and TV stations with the national frequency, uh, which somehow spin certain stories. So my question would be, how does the EU intend to communicate its intentions towards the Western Balkans, if other uh, outlets such as the Deutsche Welle, which is here, or Radio for Europe, or European Western Balkans, plays a rather small role in the lives of the citizens of the of the uh, of the Western Balkans. So my the, the short question would be uh, how communication will happen, and how these intentions will be communicated to the citizens directly or indirectly. Thank you. Did we have a volunteer to respond? I first wanted to say this is the question to the not present representative of the DG Near, and we forgot to answer the question for the thesis. But yes. <laughs> it just came into my mind. But I wanted to say, well, uh, I will be a bit um, over-exaggerating now, but um, 
do you want to be part of the family of values uh, and freedoms of the Europeans? Or a guy of Velika Rasia getting a passport under their hand and being mobilized the next day? Do you want to work for Continental or for Ling Long in the plant? And I think the answer is quite easy for everybody in the region. That doesn't mean that Europe is doing enough and it's good enough, but sometimes we have to be perhaps a bit more uh, clear on the overall positive story which we can offer anyway, which is fitting much better to this region than this third actors can offer. And I don't mean UK and US, no. <laughs> um, and then I have actually no doubt about the region uh, and the willingness here. Uh, the doubts in the region are coming because of the feeling that uh, we don't want. It's a kind of like you try to date somebody five times and you get a mixed answer and then somebody else is more open than you might tend to him. So the first step is that we show we are interested. We want to date you really. But of course, the necessary reforms have to take place also. <laughs> At least by date. He says marriage, and he will say, even if he will never marry it, she will still go on dating with us. Yes, and I mean, uh, I don't want to exaggerate too much which life model is right, but for sure, I mean, that what the European Union can offer also with the strengths of member states. Yeah, this is, I think, of course, more convincing. I would say that I'm not so sure if this argument, I also know that the European Union was delivering the most vaccines. But I think we haven't been fast enough. So in the real first phase of the crisis, there was the clear feeling in the region that first we think about ourselves, then we think about the other EU 26, 27, and then we think perhaps about the Western Balkans. And this was a mistake. I remember also how we were trying to push uh, for, uh, for vaccines shared from the German stocks, and it was not so easy. And it's really important to try to do this better in this autumn and this winter regarding energy. And the first point to this is that everybody is sitting together at the table immediately. And I think this is also from symbolism really important. We will never be in propaganda as good or as mean or as others, but this like invite you and show like, hey, this is our common crisis. We're going to go together. I hope we will manage this out. I think it's not clear if this will be successful. I don't know if European Union will have enough means. Uh, I think it also depends on factors which we cannot influence. But um, I wouldn't say European Union was bad regarding COVID, but for sure we can be better and we should try to be better. What's the Dutch attitude towards propaganda in favor of the European Union? Uh, well, that, that's actually a question that wasn't asked, uh, but I'm, oh, happy, yes, oh, yes. I'm happy to answer. No, no, the, the question was more uh, about media, the importance of media freedom. And I also wanted to answer that question because for me, freedom, media freedom and independent media, independent journalism is at the core of a properly functioning democracy and a, also a properly functioning rule of law, which again, come back to the principles of uh, well, European value. So I would fully support, and it's actually a priority for both the Netherlands and the European Union to focus on it. And it's in fact also part of the enlargement process to uh, um, uh, keep this in, in uh, or to, to, uh, to adjudicate that. And then coming back to, to your question, uh, and it, it is related, I would also, uh, there's, a, there's also a, a large responsibility on leaders from this region, as there is on leaders within the European Union to not only blame the EU for any unpopular measure that has been taken, regardless of whether or not that measure actually did or did not come from, from Brussels. There is, a, uh, um, there, there is a burden on leaders to also portray the real story about the European Union, what the EU is actually already doing in this region, what the EU is doing to help countries progress on the trajectory of, of enlargement. And this is something that is unfortunately very often uh, uh, easily forgotten in, uh, in all of our societies. 
Um, let me come see if I answered uh, no. The other question was on uh, foreign policy alignment. Um, we would very much like to see a progressive foreign policy alignment or alignment with EU's foreign policy. And unfortunately, we don't see it everywhere in the region. Uh, an example are, uh, for example, the visa regimes that are currently in place here in, in the region and that are quite uh, deriving from, um, diverging, I should say, from, from the EU's. Uh, and it is also very much part of the uh, uh, enlargement process. And, uh, and with regards to the rule of law, a chicken and egg question, I would very much like to continue that discussion uh, maybe over over a drink or, or dinner sometime, but uh, a yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you were in, when, when you were responding to the issue of foreign policy alignment, for a moment I thought that you would mention Hungary as the disruptor in the European Union, but we are talking especially about the, the region itself. Uh, more questions? If I may. Yes, of course, ma'am. Because my answers sometimes are more provocative than your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I will try harder, I promise. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, regarding uh, alignment, Greece also pays attention to this issue. It's very important. The alignment of uh, Western Balkan countries and all candidate countries, I stress this fact, not only Western Balkans, but all candidate countries have to follow the path towards full alignment with EU decisions on the foreign policy issues. Second, regarding this vicious circle that uh, was uh, referred to by the two gentlemen that raised the questions, in fact, quite similar if I may say. You raised uh, two questions of uh, the rule of law in economy. You raised the question of the press, of the freedom of the press and of the messages of the EU and uh, of the counter propaganda measures. According to my views, the first counter propaganda measures would be a real freedom of the press, which is in the hands of tycoons that serve their own financial interests and are very close to countries that are eager to propagate their policies through these media. If we have a free economy in Western Balkan countries, and also in all EU countries, we wouldn't have this phenomenon that we have more and more media in the hands of very powerful people that have perhaps sometimes nothing to do with real freedom of the market, with real freedom of the voices, of freedom of expression, and the EU does not have special budgets for propaganda issues. We have our messages, but these messages can be delivered through democratic media. We cannot pay for advertising the EU policies. We can just have our statements, our, uh, uh, let's say, announcements of what has been done, but if there is no interest uh, in a media to propagate in favor of the EU, then we miss some audience. So my, my feeling is that in fact, we have our means also for the justice people, for the judges, not to have salaries of 400 euros. Why? Because in this process of enlargement, the EU will have great, let's say, uh, funds in favor of the justice uh, 
uh, reform section and the governments can of course raise the salaries of the judges to attract judges of uh, real quality. So if a, a government gets some money for the justice sector, it depends on the government how mm -hmm. it will use this money also to attract judges that either can be attracted by 400 euro and not look for other means to, let's say, complete their salaries or have higher salaries. Thank you. Would there be more Can I? questions? Here? Yes, madam. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I am Albana. Uh, I am here on behalf of Democracy Plus, a civil society organization based in Kosovo. So uh, since we were talking a lot about uh, uh, money coming from the EU, I mean help and uh, budgets, I have to say that uh, each time we uh, monitor the government or as citizens if we if we want to check whether the government is serious in terms of implementing a certain policy or prioritizing a certain policy we always check for the budget and we check we tend to see if that policy is budgeted and how much budget is spent in that regard so that's why uh, that is I mean that's why we're talking a lot about it and that's how we will understand whether enlargement is really a priority for the EU or whether it is, it is going to remain a priority only in papers in the coming decade. So, um, as because we've also seen that pre-accession funds have uh, decreased and I have, uh, I mean, not in numbers because we know that IPA 1 was 11 point something billion then 12 point something and then we had the IPA 3 is 14 point, um, Eight, I think, but uh, from what I've read in terms of purchasing power, that has decreased. So this is no good news for the Western Balkans. Uh, so my question is uh, simple, uh, particularly in the case of Kosovo, like how do you plan to restore the EU conditionality uh, credibility in Kosovo when we talk about the visa regime, like that is in particularly related to that. And I have another very short question uh, for the uh, Greek special envoy, like what is the plan of Greece in terms of recognizing the independence of Kosovo? Are there any plans in this regard? Can you share it with us? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant Blagojevic and Transparency International, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, my question would be uh, related to what we witnessed over the last several years, a situation in which Western Balkans are receiving uh, contradictory messages from certain member states. <laughs> I will not uh, uh, naming the names, but no, you will... name them. It helps for the debate. Okay, the... I, I have yes. no problem to name the names. Uh, yeah. Hungary, Croatia, uh, which play in uh, very often and in many situations uh, uh, quite detrimental role uh, uh, towards the Western Balkan, and which is contradictory to what we are uh, uh, listening from the Brussels. So uh, I, I would be uh, interested to, to, to uh, hear your comments on that. Uh, is there uh, any internal mechanisms how to prevent that? I'm, I'm sure you are uh, very well aware of what I'm uh, speaking uh, about interfering in, in, in internal affairs on, on, on very, uh, how to say, in very negative uh, way. Uh, and second, uh, uh, question or better uh, I, I will kindly ask you to comment on that we are fully aware uh, about all uh, uh, um, conditionality and then and obligations that uh, western balkan countries need to fulfill but we again uh, witnessed the situation uh, where the western balkan country in particular i i, I mean uh, north macedonia fulfilled all things that uh, was asked to fulfill and we all know what, what was happening. So that is, in, in, in my opinion, something that uh, uh, influenced credibility of the EU in Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Perhaps a third question. Yes, sir. 
Hi, uh, my name is Mar Barbulushi. I work for the Regional Cooperation Council and uh, our organization does yearly uh, Balkan barometer surveys and uh, in the recent public uh, opinion survey, I think uh, it, it was above 90% uh, uh, the wish of the population to join the European Union. So it shows that our, in our region, there is a high consensus uh, to join the European Union and join the, the, the family uh, of values of the European Union. However, uh, my question would be especially to Mr. Saratin. Uh, there was also a recent uh, news report. A survey was made among the German population, I think the Spanish population and the French population. And uh, support for EU enlargement in the Western Balkan was actually much lower compared to that of Ukraine. Uh, so perhaps uh, um, my question would be, is there any plan by your side to, to, to also promote the progress that has been happening in the region uh, in terms of uh, EU enlargement uh, reforms that has been conducted here. In order perhaps there might be also misperception also I, in my personal opinion, also uh, on, in terms of the progress that the Western Balkans have achieved. So well, what, is there a plan also to engage with the population in the EU member states on, on, on Western Balkan enlargement? Thank you. I think that there is a common ground to all three questions, and this is the credibility of the enlargement policy of the EU when confronted with things happening on the ground, both within the EU and outside the EU. Mr. Saracen, perhaps you want to start because the last question was directly to you. Of course, we try to be more convincing, and these numbers and the pollings which we see throughout the region are, of course, not in the way that we are confident uh, and it should stay like this. Um, but I really strongly believe in the Schumann method and that the European Union in the end was built over not one great plan, but solidarity of action. And I'm also convinced that if we get back on track, building back the credibility by delivering step by step, small stone by small stone, the picture will become more clear again. Uh, in Germany, I can tell you that uh, while perhaps one or two years ago, you had difficulties to explain to uh, some journalists, some public opinion, some then for me voters or possible voters, uh, the importance of the region, not to all, but to some, yeah? um, since the war, it is more simple for us. So what I said about the war in the region, if you want to attract any German journalist to say like, Listen, you see Russia, uh, we have to care for Western Balkans, they buy it immediately. So it doesn't mean that we immediately have it as a kind of support for enlargement, but at least in the German population and in the German media situation, uh, it is easier to uh, reach interest for the region due to the geopolitical situation. Um, this is something we can exploit, use, or we can <laughs> miss the chance, <laughs> like so often, uh, as you know. Third, regarding um, situation in German population, I was always really in favor of having a strong parliament in European businesses, uh, <clears throat> European affairs of the governments, uh, because I was sure that only in public and frank debate in parliament will in the end bring people also in following the arguments of, of us on Europe. Also regarding enlargement. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why I think it's really important that in the enlargement processes in the country, you need to think about involvement of civil society, but also of parliaments and transparency of debate. To have this process is not only technocratic processes, not against technocrats, they are great, um, but also to have to, to follow. But regarding what you said is, in Germany, uh, it is the German parliament deciding at the beginning and at the end of uh, enlargement process. And in the German parliament, you have a great grand coalition from the CDU, CSU to the Greens, even to some parts of the leftists who uh, have a clear position on that out of geopolitical and national interest of Germany and Europe, that they are in favor of uh, enlargement in the region. And there can be so far no doubt, you don't have to doubt about Germany. Opinion polls are important, but whatever is in opinion polls, we have a grand support for accession of the region to the European Union. Uh, in the mainstream European, in mainstream German politics, among the main parties, also from uh, today's opposition, uh, uh, like it was before when the others were in opposition. And I think this is a 
good news. Or not the news actually, but good. <laughs> but Madam Gramata, there was a specific question whether Greece is going to recognize Kosovo's independence. Uh, Mike, Mike. Position, Greece's position on Kosovo, no matter our stance, our position on the status issue, is acknowledged by Pristina as a very constructive approach. And uh, we have, in fact, uh, very strong cooperation ties with Pristina. And uh, Greece has never hidden the fact uh, that it's pretty much in favor of the visa-free regime for the citizens of Kosovo. Regarding uh, uh, the other questions that have been raised, I don't want to comment on EU member states' uh, positions. But um, I would like to say regarding uh, not only Bosnia-Herzegovina, but all the candidate or potential candidate countries, that uh, the EU member states have granted part of their sovereignty, in fact, to the EU institutions, to the EU as a whole. This has been felt deeply by the Greek population recently, but also has been felt by other countries. And we had referenda in the past regarding this uh, very, I mean, core question, very, very crucial question, whether a country wants to grant parts of its uh, sovereignty to this big and successful organization, which is the EU. And uh, the EU populations have voted in favor. Why? Because in this uh, international environment, we all feel weak. Even large countries of the EU, as Germany, as other very large EU countries. I may speak also on your behalf, dear Manuel, but I think even your of country course. would be weak in this international environment. So every give and take has pro and contra. Of course, it's not always pleasant for a country to be criticized. My country has been deeply and somehow also perhaps in a little bit unjust way criticized. But okay, at the end, we take what was positive and the reforms were positive and to the benefit of Greek people. This is my answer. And I wish to Bosnia and Herzegovina all success towards the EU integration. Uh, Mr. Sarcin feels uh, obliged to react. Germany is not weak, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was handling euro crisis as an MP in German parliament. And actually, uh, the Greens were voting in opposition in favor of the Greek bailout packages. And I was the responsible guy in the fraction. And this was some tough time in my life. And I was harshly criticized in Germany in my own party for it sometimes. But always whenever I was going to Greece, even of those who didn't like the bailout packages, they knew that actually it was uh, a job which I did because I'm convinced that Greece belongs to the European Union. So today, if we now take a theoretical approach, imagine we have this war now. In 2015, Greece would have pushed out of the Euro and this would have meant for sure also out of the European Union. What this means for Western Balk, what this would mean for Western Balkan states today with this war, it would be horrific. Because of some Euros or perhaps even not because actually we earn money from the loans we gave to Greece. But also compared to even if we lost all this money, but now also imagine if the referendum Mr. Varoufakis wanted to make, wanted to win on getting out of the euro and de facto then also the European Union probably later was successful. 
what this would mean for Greece today, you said this other candidacy states, <laughs> uh, which you mentioned. So it is so much clear that whoever, you know, Germany is of course the biggest member state, but you shall never underestimate that without the European Union, our economy would be not this backbone. The internal market is the backbone of everything that we do in Germany. And uh, the security questions as well, also cultural questions. You cannot imagine the success of Germany without the internal market and the European Union at all. You cannot imagine the situation today of Greece, of Germany, of any country without this project. And there, Peter, also when he left already, <laughs> I think our answers were so good he could leave already. Um, is right. It was always the political will. And what people always underestimated that quite often the European Union has a strong political will, sometimes only in the very last moment. But usually in the very last moment, it is then there. And I think what's really important to know for this region is that um, here we still have a lot of things in our hand. Not all, of course, we gave already some away also, but it's still clear that we have still enough power to take it to the right way. But the time to use it, it's limited. Yeah? We cannot just play on and hope it will develop. Right. Mr. Saracin's Philippica was about the cohesion of the European Union, and I think it fits extremely well into the debate that we're having today. But of course, each Philippica contains an awful lot of wishful thinking. And uh, but this is about politics, right? Politics about showing the way. And uh, you are the lucky person. You are closing the event. And uh, I think that a lot of questions, especially in the last round, was about the instruments to discipline member states of the European Union if they are doing disruptive policies in external relations. The example was uh, Croatia and Hungary mostly in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgar Bulgaria towards what is now North Macedonia. And if Ambassador Gramata promises not to be very angry at me, remember the times when Greece was giving uh, the then former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia a very, very hard time. This is a very good example you made. Why? Because it's never one country. It's not by chance that after Greece signed the PRESP agreement, another country appeared. Yes. All EU decisions are collective decisions. We cannot speak about one country hindering the road of one other country because it's a collective decision. And since only one country is needed for this decision to be blocked, yes. then other countries stand behind. Is even is 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 uh, majority voting in foreign policy and security the instrument to act against such behavior of one country disrupting the policy of everyone else? As I said, it's never one. But at this moment, it was one, right? No. 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 It was not uh, only Athens blocking uh, Skopje. Uh, according, for example, to what was said, only Athens blocked Skopje with regard to the NATO uh, road of Skopje. Have you seen the... The French uh, were quite supportive have you as seen, well, yes. Have you seen the summit's decision? Yeah. Was only Athens? Yeah. No, But it's, it's not only about NATO, it's about was 20 not, years. But now we are entering a so, bilateral debate yes. and I think that Urian is keen to tell us how to solve the problems with unanimity and majority. <laughs> I fear that, I fear that. Thank you, you know, I'm a scholar, I don't even know. But uh, uh, <laughs> uh, what can I say? Uh, well, luckily, and in particular, in the case of, of Bosnia, uh, in the end, EU's policies towards uh, countries in this region are always consensus. So that means that the negotiations have taken place and that certain voices that you may hear quite vocally in, uh, in media in Brussels are also met with counter voices and, uh, and the end result is, uh, is a negotiated position. And in particular in this case uh, and or in this region, I think that is, uh, that is a good thing. 
So no majority voting. No majority voting, no. Oh, yes. no Chancellor yeah. Scholz won't be happy to hear this. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Now I have to go home to Berlin. <laughs> Thank you. But how about the visa liberalization? You will vote in favor, yes? Well, <laughs> for, for, no, for visa liberalization, we await the Commission's uh, um, uh, appraisal of uh, the track record that it needs to be presented, in particular in areas of migration, organized crime, uh, terrorism, and, and, and a few others. I think that this is the very right moment to move from the panel to the wine section over there i think that I, I, at least i hope that you enjoyed the debate i think we gave a properly right time to our speakers and let's give them an applause a clap at the end for their for what they suffered Thank you.